Good morning, everyone. Welcome on this beautiful Sunday morning to worship. It's good to be with you to sing praises to our Lord. And we're going to open our service together, singing together hymn number 377. If you're able to stand, let's unite our voices and sing, Alleluia, sing to Jesus. Good singing, everybody. Would you welcome those around you this morning? And then we'll sing two more songs together.
praise you today, Lord. Help us to see your work in our life, your hand at work in the lives of those around us, and help us to be your vessels to carry the message of Jesus Christ into this world. We praise you, for you are holy, and you are our prince and king forever. Thank you, Jesus. You are holy. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are worthy. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will follow. I will listen. I will listen. I will love.
Heavenly Father, how grateful and thankful we are again this morning that we can praise you for your creating of our lives, that we can praise you for the gift of your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, who has redeemed our lives and forgiven us of our sins, that we can praise you and celebrate you for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit who draws us closer to you every moment of our lives, identifying for us your word, your will, and the next step that we need to take. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship you and you alone. So receive our song, receive our prayer, receive our love as we study your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And brothers and sisters, may you always know how deeply your heavenly Father loves you and how fully your sins have been forgiven through his one and only son, Jesus Christ. As all God's people say, amen. Please be seated. Mr. Jack, would you go up here with me? Jeremy and Sean will be with you. Can I tell stories first? Is that all right? No, no, I'm just... <laughs> I don't have a special relationship. You don't know who this is. This is my grandson. Um, two, two real quick stories. Number one, um, my dad died three years ago, and uh, most of the grandkids were old enough that I was able to take them up to the casket. And we talked about, you will see Grandpa Glenn again, and that's what he gives. He's great-Grandpa Glenn. I think almost every prayer that you've prayed since, you'll always pray for great-Grandpa Glenn. And to Jay, today, Jack, I know that you're going to be with him someday because you're going to commit yourself to Jesus. Last time I was up on the stage with you was right behind that thing. Ten years have gone like that, and your mom and dad in this church and many others promised to raise you, and you've gotten to the point in your life where, here we go. Already? Thank you. Jack, you've been asked these questions in front of the elders. We're going to do this again. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior? What is your answer? Yes. Thank you. Jack, that is an eternal one. If I live long enough to do your wedding someday, okay, that's only going to last a lifetime. But this is going to last forever. Number two, do you rely upon Jesus and only Jesus to forgive your sins? Jack, what is your answer? Jack, do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, the Bible, to be your only uh, guide, your only direction in your life, the one that shows you the true way? Do you look at scripture that way? What is your answer? Thank you. Now some behavior ones. Number one, do you promise to make faithful use of the means of grace? That means when the church is open and you can hear them preach to be here and also baptism and communion. You can have communion now. Do you promise to give faithful obedience to the doctrines of the church and of God's word? This is a hard one, Jack. Do you promise to, to give yourself or submit yourself to Christian discipline. That means when God disciplines you, he does it because he loves you. Do you promise to walk in the spirit of fellowship and brotherly love with other Christians? Do you promise to offer to God your prayers and your gifts? And do you promise to seek the things that make for purity and peace in your life? Jack, there's not a person in this church that can do all that. So we're asking this, with God's help, Will you try, with God's help, to do all those things? What is your answer? Yes. Thank you so much. I'll hold his hand if that's all right. Let's hold hands. Pray with us, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Again, uh, 10 years goes so quickly. We thank you for baptism. We had some of that in the first service, and Nixon will be baptized in a few minutes. And Lord, we promise to raise these children when this comes to that point, Lord, we give you all the praise and glory. Come into Jack's life. We know it's going to be tough. Just surround him and protect him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Would you share us? Thank you. You may be seated. And it's also a beautiful picture as uh, TJ and Stephanie Van Rie come forward. 
And it's a beautiful picture because we recognize that all life is a gift from God and how beautiful it is to raise these children up that God has entrusted to our care for a time. And how beautiful it is when we can see God's covenant promise from one generation to a second generation to a third and to a fourth generation. And so today is a beautiful day. God continues to grow your family. And who knows where he's going to stop, right? So all children are a gift from God. So we're grateful right now for three sons. But Stephanie and TJ, I ask you this question. Do you continue to affirm your faith in Jesus Christ? And do you acknowledge that Jesus is both your Savior and your Lord? Is he? Amen. Do you believe that, uh, that God has blessed you with one, two, three sons, now Nixon? And do you believe, as handsome as this little man is, uh, that he was conceived and born in sin and is under the judgment of God? But do you believe that according to the word and the truth of God, God's plan involves his life? And there is a way for him to be forgiven of his sins, and that name is Jesus. So do you believe that the word of God provides a path for his life? Stephanie and TJ, do you believe that? Amen. Then how is he going to know that way and that truth and that life? As parents who confess and follow Jesus, will you do all you can to raise him up in the way that he should go? Will you pray and teach him how to pray? Will you read him God's word? Will you be in worship with him, growing together in the faith? And will you be leading him to that very moment that by the power of the Holy Spirit one day, just like Jack did, he will stand here and receive Jesus? as his Savior and his Lord. With God's help, TJ and Stephanie, will you do that for him? Amen. Pastor Mike is going to go for a walk. I said the people are a lot more important than looking at me. This is Nixon James. Nixon means one who overcomes. And James means one who nurtures and is nurtured. Nixon James, we pray that you will overcome the things of this earth and be devoted to Christ. Number two, we pray that mom and dad and all these people will help nurture you and someday you will help nurture others. Congregation, would you stand please? We just talked about this. Yes, mom and dad have primary responsibilities for raising children, but you're going to help. You're going to teach him. You're going to be an example to him, I pray. You're going to have him at times where you can raise him up in the church. I ask you, <laughs> will you pray for him, teach him how to pray, and train him by your example? If you will, please say, we will. We will. Thank you. TJ and Stephanie, I'll have you make your way behind the baptismal. And can you boys see in here? You see what's in here? What is this? Water. It's water. And water washes what off of us? All the dirt, right? You ever get dirty? Yeah, sometimes we get dirty when we're outside. This water is not going to wash any of the dirt off our outside. But this water helps us to remember that only Jesus washes us on the inside and only Jesus can forgive us of our sins. So TJ, I'll have you present Nixon. <laughs> Nixon, James, I baptize you in the name of the Father. I baptize you in the name of the Son and I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Amen. And as we place the lid back, we will circle up in a word of prayer. And church family, join with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are grateful, and we praise you for family, that there are a mom and a dad who love you, 
and make much of you as they train up their three sons in the way that they should go. We thank you for a grandpa and a grandma who are here today as well. And we thank you for great grandma Jan. Father, you have been faithful from generation to generation. And we pray that your covenant holds strong until that moment you return to call all your own unto yourself. We love you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Would you go ahead and thank God for his blessing and his promise in our lives. And as Steph and TJ are seated, uh, know this, they will be at one of the doors in the back along with Jack and uh, anticipating uh, your congratulations and your words of encouragement. Uh, in just a few weeks, and it is only going to be a few weeks, um, there's going to be something special happening here at church. And so I need a helper. Are you willing to help me? Can you come here a minute? Please. You know what? I, I know you're pretty big. Can I do this? Oh. How old are you now? Four and a half. You're four and a half. Not four. Four and a half. And in just a few weeks here at church, there's going to be something very special happening. We're going to be having vacation Bible school. And I'm so glad that we all just had the opportunity to make some promises to your little brother, Nixon. Because we have promised that we're going to help these children to grow up to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and as their Lord. And there are many of our own sons and daughters who are going to be in attendance that week. But there's going to be even more children who join us and who come from the surrounding neighborhoods. Probably more than 800 um, little boys and girls are going to be here. And we need your help. We need you to make good on the promise that you just made. I know it might be difficult for you to get off of work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday morning. I understand that. Some folks are already using some vacation time, and that is greatly appreciated. If you can be there, we have tables set up in the back. We're looking for folks who love Jesus and who love children. You don't have to have all the answers, but we need you to know the name of Jesus, and we need together to make serious on the promise that we've made. You'll see all the different ways that you can serve, all the different ways you can be a part of Vacation Bible School. And let's continue to impact these lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. We're also going to spend some time together in prayer this morning. We ask that you keep a number of families in your prayer. You see it is Shirley Vendis's husband, John, who passed away suddenly, continuing to pray for the Dykema family. It's Bonnie has passed away. Also want to continue to pray uh, for Elaine Kirkstra as her breathing continues to slow, but as she is so peaceful and anticipating the wonderful face of God. So let's keep the Kirkstra family in our prayer as well. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for today. We stop and we pause and we want to be grateful and thankful for every single day because they do not simply happen on their own. We believe that every day is a gift from you. It is ordained by you. And you promise not to get too far ahead in that day, not to schedule too much in that day, but to live it out moment by moment and to have your Holy Spirit be that lamp and that guide unto our feet that we would take one step at a time, never getting ahead of you. Father, we thank you for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, moving Jack this morning to stand up and to receive the greatest gift, the greatest relationship, that is Jesus. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that has Steph and TJ to know that every child is a gift from you, and they've made that promise to train up Nixon in the way that he should go. Father, that reminds us again today to be grateful for moms, to be grateful for grandmas and, and great-grandmas, those aunts, Father, those women of the faith who have invested themselves mightily into the lives of, of children. 
Father, their own children, but, but whatever children they have wonderful, godly influence over. And we know that that is some of the most tiring and exhausting of work. And sometimes we wonder if it's making any difference. Father, for those moms who are here, for those spiritual, faithful, godly women who are here, if they are tired, I pray that you will strengthen them. If they are weary, I ask you to refresh them. Father, if they feel that they are at the end of themselves, there may they find you and may they find renewed strength. Lord, we pray for those today who love you and who've loved the ones that they've trusted into your care. We pray for the Dykemas, for the Vendisses. Father, we think of others right now who are caring for family members and who are walking these uh, moments uh, quietly and stilly. Father, be with them. So many others, we thank you for Mark as he's doing well and he's here right now. Thank you for every beat of his heart that he's fearfully and wonderfully made. Father, for those who are continuing to recover, we know we've had a number of folks in the hospital. We have some folks who are still awaiting a word from the doctors. We ask you to provide patience in this time. And Father, that you would always have your will and your way to be the very best. May our hope, may our trust, and may our faith be in you. And now we admit that we are hungry. I admit, we admit that we are thirsty and this world has left us wanting and this world has left us in need. Through your faithful servant, Pastor Jeremy, may we feast upon the truth of your word, but never simply that we know more, but now that we would uh, more faithfully live it out every moment and every breath of our lives. And Father, receive too our lives as living sacrifices. And even now, may we bring you our time and our talent and our treasure. Father, thank you for being incredibly generous. May we be generous and joyful in return. And we will pray it always in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. We do invite our deacons to come forward at this time. It is our opportunity to give back to God. We also invite you this morning, we welcome you if you are visiting. This is God's house, it's God's church, and all the worship is for Him. If you're a visitor, you'll find a blue card right there in the pew, the row where you are seated. If you have a special need or prayer request, make note of that. Share the card with us at the information desk. We'd love to meet you personally. And for the rest of us, let's pass the fellowship pads as we continue to connect names and faces. Let's continue now in song.
And as you're seated, we are going to see the word of Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite you this morning to turn to the book of Zephaniah in the Old Testament. Zephaniah, as we consider all three chapters this morning. If you're not familiar with Zephaniah, just go to the start of the New Testament and work your way backwards. You will be there in no time. Zephaniah, one of the Old Testament minor prophets. As you're turning there, a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers gathered with us this morning. Uh, this week I took some time to kind of ask some questions of some mothers that I know of in my life that I respect, that I see as godly women. And I asked them, what, what do you want on Mother's Day? What's a, what's a good Mother's Day sermon? And uh, many of them said very clearly, you know, for Mother's Day you want to honor me? You want to call me to something? Jeremy, show me Jesus. Show me Jesus in the gospel. Call my, my husband to Jesus. Call my kids, if they're with me today, to Jesus. Call, call my grandkids to Jesus. Jeremy, if you want to honor me in my role as a mother, then partner with me in calling everyone I love to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so this morning, a little different Mother's Day sermon, not so much on the topic of motherhood, but looking at the book of Zephaniah, calling all of us to love what Zephaniah teaches, but then applying it in a few spots specifically to mothers. What will it look like for a mother to love and rejoice over the truth of Zephaniah? So with that open before you, let's look at Zephaniah chapter 1 as we just read half of verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, son of Cush. Let's pray. Father, we have your word open before us this morning. We thank you for the clarity of your word today. We thank you that your spirit is living and active in this word. And so, Father, we pray for our hearts this morning that we would be receptive to this word, that we would delight in every aspect of it, and that our lives would be transformed in light of it. Father, may this time not just be a religious exercise of teaching, but may it truly be a, a time of communing with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's in that glorious name we pray. Amen. So Zephaniah chapter 1 is before you, and this morning we're just going to look at the entire book seeing two big ideas. This morning I want you to see from Zephaniah that God is just and that God is merciful, and that in those two attributes of God you can build your entire life, is justice and is mercy. And if you're here this morning as a mother, that you're going to want to model your motherhood, your mothering around the justice, and around the mercy of God. A little background for you by way of Zephaniah. You see there in verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah. Now he is a prophet. He's a minor prophet. Again, minor just because the book is small. It's only a, a few short chapters. Not a major prophet, which would be a longer book. But Zephaniah is an ordinary guy. And God shows up to him in his time and in his place, right around the reign of Josiah, the king. And Zephaniah is living life. And God shows up and says, I have a message for my people, Zephaniah, and you're going to be the one who delivers it. This was more than likely around 622 to 612 B.C., a real place, in a real time, with the real people. And Zephaniah, for three quarters of this book, all he's going to do is talk about darkness and judgment that are coming upon the people of God. Happy Mother's Day, right? Is there a better message than that for Mother's Day? Ladies, come on. Darkness and judgment for three quarters of the book. That's a Mother's Day sermon. But in the last quarter, Zephaniah is going to give you some of the richest and most profound examples of God's mercy and God's love to his people and to all people who call on his name. And so the book of Zephaniah is one that I really want you to treasure. So let's begin with the judgment, let's begin with the darkness, and let's see how this forms our lives. Look at Zephaniah, again, beginning in verse 2. The judgment. He begins this way. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both men and animals. It's all gone. I will sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. The wicked will have only heaps of rubble when I cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. And so Zephaniah opens up with a very nice, hello, 
you're done. It's over. I'm going to wipe you out. A complete and total judgment. No wiggle room whatsoever. And remember, he's speaking not to the nations right now. Who's he speaking to? God's people. And he's saying, God has observed what's gone on in your land, and I'm going to wipe you out. Now, you should be asking the question, why? That, that seems awfully aggressive. That seems awfully clear. Why is God saying this? Well, that's a great question. Look at verse 5. He's going to give you exactly why God is bringing about justice. Verse 5 has three distinct things you need to see. Those who, number one, bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host. That's the first group. That's why I'm upset. Number two, those who bow down and swear by the Lord and who also swear by Molech. Third group, those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. So what Zephaniah is saying, I have three groups of people. There's a first group of people. When I look out at my nation, they flat out, verse 5, they worship the starry host. What's he saying? My people, there's a group of you. You look out and see the stars in the sky, and you join in with the pagan nations, and you worship their gods with them. You see all that can be worshipped, and you just you jump right into it. You bow down. That's the word for worship. Second, that's not bad enough. I've got a group of you who bow down and swear by me, the Lord, but at the same time, what are they doing? Molech. So this first group, they're out there just worshiping whatever works. I got this second group who want to kind of keep me in their worship, but at the same time, they're bringing in all these other religions. They're pluralists. And then I got this third group, verse 6. They don't even seek me. They don't even inquire of me, meaning they don't seek my wisdom. So the reason God in Zephaniah is bringing a clear and total judgment on his people is because they're worshiping other gods, they're trying to have a foot in both worlds, or they've just walked away altogether and they don't get their life and their wisdom from the God of Yahweh. And so God is saying to this people, this isn't going to last. So look at verse 12, what he does. Now, at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish those who are complacent, who are like the wine left on its dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. That's verse 12. Look at verse 13. Their wealth will be plundered, their houses demolished. They will build houses but not live in them. They will plant vineyards but not drink the wine. What is he saying? I've got a whole nother group of people. They're absolutely complacent. They don't understand my nature. They look at me and they think I don't care. They look at me and think I don't have an opinion that I'm going to act on. They look at me and say, he's lazy. He's not holy. He's not checking up on us. So guess what? Here in Jerusalem, we can do whatever we want. We can live life how we desire. And God is looking down at them and saying, seriously? I see that house you're building. You will never live a day in it. See that vineyard you're working on over there? Nice, impressive, I like it. You'll never taste the fruit. God, through Zephaniah, is bringing a clear and total judgment on his people. Now go back to verse 1. This is so important. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah. So let me be very clear with you. Don't get soft on me at this point where you're going to want to say, no, 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 this isn't God, this isn't how God acts, or, you know, this is an Old Testament passage, you know, God's cranky in the Old Testament, but boy, once Jesus shows up, then God's really happy, right? So this is just Old Testament language, I, I don't have to deal with this. Yes, you do. Let me give you an example. This weekend, on Friday, uh, some neighbors very graciously said, can we watch your kids? And my wife and I said, of course you can. And she said, you know what, go on a date. So we did. We drove downtown and went to Wealthy Street, and there's a great little taco place on Wealthy. We get out of the car, and we're walking on the sidewalk, and there's this forklift up in the air with some guys doing construction on a building. And one of the guys leans over the edge and says, hey, what you doing? I look up, and I'm like, I have no idea who you are. Uh, I said, I'm going out for dinner, just having a great Friday afternoon. And I kept on walking. And he runs to the other side of the forklift, and he goes, no, seriously, what are you doing, man? I said, I'm going out to have lunch, some tacos across the street. 
He goes, come on, Visser, seriously, it's Friday. Why aren't you at work? <laughs> okay, okay, but hold on, hold on. He thinks I'm my brother. So now the evil twin kicks in. And I said, well, what else are you going to do on a Friday? Who works on a Friday? Whatever. I'm going to have tacos. And he says, quote, are you on a date? And I just said, have a great day. And I walked across the road. So we get across the road, and this is serious, and we sit down and have tacos outside. And I can see where he's working on this forklift. And you can tell he, he's, he's done. He cannot contemplate this. He thinks Justin, his friend, is off on Friday with another woman. And so he's looking at this. So I text my brother and say, hey, there's this guy across the street. Who is he? He sends me his name, and he sends me details about his life. So after lunch, we walk across the street with my wife. We stand by the street, and he is right there. He's standing there. Dude, what's up? And I said, hey, I said his name. I'm not going to say it out loud. I said his name, and I asked him some personal questions. And now he is hooked. He is looking at me going, that, that is not your wife. I just saw you have lunch. What's going on, man? And the blood is out of his face, and he is serious. And finally, Marie's like, stop it. And I, so I told him, it's not me. And my brother texted me, cleared it up. Now, here's the point. He knew things about my brother, what he looks like, what he does for a living, what his wife looks like. And then when he was faced with this situation, everything in him said, no, that is not the guy I know. This cannot be right. And I'm going to stop work until this is clear. Here's the problem in the Christian church. Most of us read a few parts of the New Testament, some of the Gospels, and we skip Revelation. And when you come to a text like this, where God reveals in his nature that he is just and that he is holy and that an ounce of sin can remain in him, and if his people remain in sin, he is going to wipe them off in a holy, righteous judgment. Your default setting is to go, no, nope, nope, that, that cannot be, that had to be temporal, that's not the God I know or worship, because I just read the nice Psalms and the Gospels, I don't read the rest of the stuff. And here's what I'm pleading with you this morning. You have got to have a category in your mind of a God who is just and holy and righteous and who will not let sin dwell in his midst. He will not let it slide and he will deal with it clearly and consistently. Because if you will not accept this God that is holy, then you have no business accepting the God in the other quarter who is going to delight over your soul. You must have the full revelation of God our Father. And so Zephaniah is doing the hard work in this text of saying, I'm going to reveal to you what God is thinking. Look at chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It gets worse. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And there's so much more I could pick out of this. Woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials are roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves who leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are arrogant. They are treacherous men. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. God is saying, when I look at my people, this is what I see. And so, friends, I want you to come and I want you to cherish the righteousness and the holiness of God. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. The Lord within her is what? Okay, you've got to have this category. And you have to delight in this category. He is righteous. Next line. He does no wrong. So God is not being petty. He's not being indifferent. He is acting consistently. When he sees sin, he sees rebellion, he says, I have to crush it or redeem it. Morning by morning, he dispenses his justice. And every new day, he does not fail. Yet the unrighteous, they know no shame. And now here's the point. What happens in 586 B.C.? But the Assyrians show up, and they execute every single thing Nehemiah said. That city, those people, are captured. They are dragged away into slavery. The opposing armies return. They level the walls. They take down the homes. And they decimate Israel. And God has said repeatedly throughout the Old Testament, return to me, return to me, return to me. No. Okay, I'm going to turn you over. 
and judgment come. So look at how the rest of this book picks it up. Chapter 1, verse 18. This is God talking to his people. Chapter 1, verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his jealousy. Now, jealousy there is not petty. It is a consistent outflowing of his nature against sin. That's what jealousy means. The whole world will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live in the earth. Switch over to 3, 6 again. Chapter 3, verse 6. I have cut off nations. Their strongholds are demolished. I have left their streets deserted. With no one passing through, their cities are destroyed. No one will be left. No one at all. Happy Mother's Day. Now, why do I press that for so long and so hard? Because God is coming to his people and says, I do have a standard. Do not shrink back from it. And here's what we can learn from the judgment and justice of God. We get to be people who model his judgment and justice, who receive it and who delight in it. So you're a mother, and you're sitting here today, and you say, how in the world would I apply that text? Well, I'll give you some ways. You, as a Christian mother, get to uniquely model in whatever area God calls you his justice and his judgment. How would I do that? Well, first, you get to acknowledge the starry host. You get to be a woman who can look out of the world and acknowledge the other gods of the world. But unlike the ladies and men of Israel, what do you get to do? You don't bow down to the gods of the world. You stand up. And you say, I know they exist. I know there's other ways I can go. But no, I will not pursue the idols of the world. I acknowledge the starry host, but I'm going to set a tone, a model in my life that I stand before them. I don't bow. Godly women who live the reality of Zephaniah are going to be those who are exclusive to Jesus. I'm not going to bring in Baal to our house. I'm not going to bring Molech into our house. But as a godly woman, as a, as a mother, I get to display to my children the exclusivity of Jesus Christ, uniquely, passionately pursuing him alone and raising up Jesus above all other things that could entice and desire my children away. I want them to see, when they look at mom, that she was exclusive in her adoration and in her worship of Jesus. What's a mother who knows the prophecy of Zephaniah? She's one who embraces the righteousness and the justice of God. And how do you as a mom uniquely do that? But show your children that your right standing is not in your moral perfection, but it's in Jesus Christ, his son. That the justice of God is not something you shy away from, but something you delight in because you want to be found right in Christ. And so you don't shy from his justice. You welcome it. You don't hide in the darkness, but you say, God, in your holiness, in your righteousness, examine me. And wherever there is fault, wherever there is error, show me and let me walk consistently in that before my family. What does a, a, a mother who loves the prophecy of Zephaniah look like? She is one who seeks and inquires in the wisdom of God. That your children might arise and say, where does mom go for her hope? Well, she asked dad. No, not at all, right, ladies? Where does she go? She's a woman of the word. She's seeking faithfully and consistently, not perfectly, never perfectly, but she's seeking to find her mind and her heart in the wisdom of God, and I see that in my mother. And then lastly, we see here in Zephaniah that she rejects complacency. God says to get complacent, and you are a woman in your home who models an intentionality to be, have the active power of God in your life. And so we can learn from the judgment in Zephaniah that unlike Israel, we get to be people that do not just kind of walk with the idols of the world. But we get to be people who walk with the God of the Old Testament, who love his justice and do not shy away from it. Now, why is that so important? Because if you receive his justice, his, his righteous standard against you, then guess what? You also get to receive his mercy. Turn to Zephaniah chapter 3 with me, and I want this to encourage your soul this morning, that the God who is equally committed to rooting out sin is just as passionately committed to redeeming you in your sin and drawing you in. So look at Zephaniah 3 verse 9. And may these words encourage your soul. Then says God, verse 9, 
will I purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord. God is saying, look, my goal is to purify you. My goal is not to be just in wrath and judgment, but my judgment has a purpose and that it's going to find you guilty, but oh, it is going to take you from your guilt and it is going to purify you to something new. So know the totality of my nature. Verse 9, I want to purify the lips of the peoples. Look at how he builds on it in chapter, uh, verse 11, part B. On that day you will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me. Because I will remove from this city those who rejoice in their pride. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. There's not going to be any shame. No more guilt before you. Look at verse 14, what he wants to do in you. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. He's saying, look, I'm going to find you in your sin, but I'm going to purify you. And when you come to submit in my lordship, you're going to rejoice. You are going to be a woman who mothers with a song on her lips because you know my love first. Yeah, I found you in your sin, but look at who I have you to be in Christ. Keep going. Verse 15 is going to give you the gospel. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. Friends, that's the truth of the gospel. That the Lord has taken away your punishment. And this is what the New Testament picks up so beautifully. That Christ stands in on your behalf. And so here in Zephaniah, speaking to old covenant people, we get a foretaste of what God's going to do in Jesus. I mean, how does he take away your punishment? Does he put it in a jar, put the lid on, put it on a shelf and say, there's your punishment, right? Still a little name on there? No. He puts it on the cross. The son gladly takes it. And he says, I will purify you in the image of Christ. You are mine. And then look how this built. Keep going, verse 16. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang lip. And then verse 17. A verse that O. Palmer Robertson, a famous Old Testament historian, says, verse 17 is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. Hear this from God to you. The Lord, verse 17, your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Guys, we don't like the symmetry, right? You want the image of God holding you and singing over you? That's not really probably where you land. But I want you to go there. Ladies, on this Mother's Day, I want you to hear this morning. I don't know if your children praise you right now in life. Maybe they never will. Maybe they only praise you at your funeral. I don't know the praise you got from a husband this morning on a card in his best feeble attempts to write you poetry or whatever else he did today. I don't know what you got. But do you know what Zephaniah 3.17 says? That on this morning, in Jesus Christ, the one who took your punishment, God's posture towards you is that he is mighty to save. He will conquer all the judgment. It says that he delights in you. He actually looks at you and he delights. And this isn't making you an idol. He, because of his redemption in you, holds you and delights in you. Ladies, he's going to quiet you with his love in the midst of all the chaos of your life. And lastly, he is rejoicing over you with singing. Can you imagine that? If your husband held you and sang? No. Not happening. But right now, in Christ, man or woman, it doesn't matter. God does not hold you in your sin and in your guilt. But he looks at you and delights at you and he cherishes you with all of his love. Friends, these are the people we want to be who find our identity and our worth in this love. And so, ladies, if I had to apply some of this grace and some of this mercy to your life as a mother, what would I say? Well, first, it's my prayer that your children would rise and they would say about you as a mother, in her I see the purifying work of Christ. 
And to see someone being purified, it means you see someone who's unpure. To be able to look at you and to see the flaws of the sinful flesh, and yet to see a woman who acknowledges when she fails, but consistently pursues the one who never fails, Jesus Christ. It's my prayer from the mercy in Zephaniah that as a mother, you would see a woman who understands the shame-shattering love of Jesus. That her love is not in her failures anymore, but that her love and her identity is in the work of God on her behalf. It's my prayer that as a mother, your children would rise and they would look at you and say, that is a woman who has a real relationship with Jesus, that she is adopted in Jesus Christ, and that she is secure in Jesus Christ. It's my prayer that your children would arise from this text and they would say her source of strength is in verse 17. When I look at my mother, she is many things and she can knock out the Fifth Third Riverbank run and she can do it in two hours and nine minutes. And that's impressive, Mom. Good job at 68. But you know where her strength is? She has the mighty one who saves. It would be my prayer that your children would arise and they would say that our mother finds her source of worth and the fact that she has a God who delights over her. And some of the greatest times of their lives when they heard you singing because you were first being sung to. It's my prayer from Zephaniah that you would see the mercy of God, that you would see mothers whose souls are content when the house isn't where it should be, where the cars don't look the way they should, where the kids aren't acting in a way that honors your name. Not because you're okay with those things, but because you have contentment in God the Father first. It's my prayer that we would have mothers who rejoice over the great love of God and that we get to hear their songs in our lives. And so brothers and sisters, my prayer is that you would know the God of Zephaniah. You would know his holiness and his judgment, and you never shy away from it. And you would say, yes, God, demand the best from me. Demand the uttermost. Show me your righteousness. And God, at the very same time, let me delight in your mercy and in your love as I turn to your Savior and the Son, Jesus Christ. And so you see it here in the text, verse 14. Sing, O daughters of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. It is my prayer that on this day you would sing of the justice and the mercy of God on your behalf. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these are the people we want to be this morning who sing of your mercy, who sing of your justice. Father, may we sing of all your attributes that we might rejoice in a life that reflects you in your fullness and that we might display the beauty of all that you are to this watching world. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Our deacons are going to come forward as we receive a reverse offering. Again, we receive because Jesus Christ is first given to us.
Whatever role God has called you to in life, he has called you to himself in that role. And may you in that role know his justice and rejoice over it. And in that role, may you equally know his mercy and his love for you and rejoice over it. And in whatever role he has you in, may you display to this world his justice and his mercy for them. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Christ is risen.